Hello everybody, today we are talking about your car's distributor. We're going to take a look inside one, talk about some of the common problems with it, and just in general what you should be looking for. Most often when I hear that somebody's having running trouble, it's not on the carburetor side of the engine, it tends to be under the distributor cap. Uh, either the points might not be set correctly, the weights aren't advancing, uh, something is generally wrong with the distributor, it's usually an ignition problem. So you should always attend to that first before going to adjust the carburetors. Mostly because even if the carburetors do need adjustment, if you go to pay attention to the ignition system, it's going to throw off the adjustment again anyway. So you're just going to end up doing it twice. Always adjust the carburetors last. But let's dive in. We'll take a look at a distributor from my Triumph TR6. I'll also show you how to install it and we'll go from there. So let's head over to the bench. Okay guys, here we have the distributor out of the car. Uh, now first, let's discuss quickly what this thing does. It's going to control when the coil fires, how the coil charges, uh, and it's also going to direct the spark to a specific cylinder. Uh, so in terms of how that happens, let's remove the cap real quick here. Okay, the spark to a specific cylinder, that's fairly obvious. You've got the cap and each one of these will connect to a different spark plug through the spark plug wires and the rotor here determines where that power goes so it comes in from the coil hits here gets directed to a given spark plug and then fires through there so that's all that does let's remove that real quick in terms of the coil charging and firing uh, that is the job of the points which is this guy here and uh, to some extent the condenser uh, so basically what's happening, you, you notice there's a wire that comes from the coil to the distributor. Connects right here. That power goes through this red wire here into the points. And when the points are closed, as they are now, it basically goes down to the plate and through this little wire here and goes to ground. And so it basically you have 12 volts or six in some cases that go to the coil. It goes through here, it's got a path to ground. So start to finish, you've got a complete circuit. And then when, I'll just rotate this a bit. When the points open, that, electric, uh, that, that electricity no longer has a path to follow because there's a gap here. So it cuts it and you turned off the switch. That's all this is, is a glorified switch that opens and closes very quickly, thousands of times per minute. So when the switch is open, now there's nowhere for the electricity to go, the field collapses, and that's when you get into the coil and you have the secondary windings, it induces a current, and it fires a spark plug and jumps it up from 12 volts to uh, 25 or 40,000, whatever the number might be, depending on your coil. So that's all that that's doing. Uh, the other thing that a distributor is going to do is it's going to determine when that spark happens. So you can advance and retard the distributor just by twisting it, uh, but you can also do that sort of internally. So uh, I'm going to hold the shaft, okay? But even holding the shaft, there is some movement that you can get in the distributor shaft because it's a two-part shaft so it sort of rotates on itself you need to make sure that you lubricate that we'll talk about that in a minute and then the other thing that can happen is that the points plate can advance or retard it can spin on an axis too and what causes that is the vacuum capsule and I will show you that by hooking up a vacuum to the vacuum capsule in this case, it's vacuum retard. Vacuum advance is going to work on the same principle. You just connect the vacuum to a different place. But as you add a vacuum, it rotates the points. See? And so they're going to open a little bit sooner or later, depending on your setup. And when the vacuum goes away, they return back to normal. So the vacuum, by the way, I like to have that connected. I know a lot of people say, oh, you don't need it, just plug it off. That's generally a bad idea. That vacuum capsule on a car that you drive on the street uh, is going to help it run under varying engine loads. It'll help it uh, at lower RPMs because uh, of the mechanical advance. It doesn't kick in until a couple thousand RPM. So when you're below that, you really need the vacuum capsule to help determine uh, just how much advance you have. So this guy is necessary for just ordinary driving. If you're going to use a car on the street and not just as a race car, you really should leave that intact. 
anyway that's important but uh, the points I'm going to show you how to set those in a moment uh, but that's basically what they do is they, they trigger the firing it's just a glorified switch now the condenser which is where's my pointer here it is the condenser this guy right here the points are opening very quickly thousands of times per minute right and so as that's happening every time it opens and closes you are going to have a spark uh, because it's going to cause some arcing as the points are opening and closing. In fact, you can even see that's happening. I don't know, well, I don't know if you can, but there's a little bit of a white film on there. These points have been getting some arcing. That's a sign the condenser's bad. So what the condenser does, uh, it's effectively, it's just kind of a shock absorber for the points. A condenser's kind of like a battery. It holds a charge and releases it. And I'll show you how you can test to make sure that it's doing that. It's not foolproof, but it's kind of a test and it's a cool thing I can show you. Now an electronic ignition will replace the points and the condenser and condensers are one of the more common pieces to fail it's kind of hard to find a good one well, how do you get a good condenser you might ask well you don't uh, there, there really aren't a whole lot of suppliers that make a reliable condenser uh, so it's kind of a crapshoot you might get a good one you might not and if you have an electronic ignition you could basically throw it out because you don't need the condenser then and so an electronic ignition will be a much more reliable system. It's not a mechanical connection like with the points. This rubbing block wears down over time. And so generally speaking, you end up setting this periodically, probably more often than you'd like. I like points. I, I'm kind of old school that way. But if you're driving your car off, and you should really consider an electronic ignition. It'll, it'll go a long way to making your car more reliable for you. And then the other thing uh, that we need to discuss real quick are these ground wires. So this one here, the red one here, what I see a lot of times under the distributor cap is that one of those wires will have broken or gotten a bit brittle and somebody will replace it with something like this. Uh, just a heavy gauge, kind of thick wire. Uh, this is absolutely the wrong kind of thing to have in there and the reason is because this plate moves. And so if those wires are not very, very flexible, then what's going to happen is it's going to restrict the movement. And so that's going to end up causing problems inside your distributor. You will not have the correct advance. It might advance and then not slow back down. So it could cause all sorts of problems. If you're going to replace the wires, make sure you use the right parts. They are not expensive. And that's basically what you want to do. So let's dig in a little bit deeper now. We'll remove some of this stuff. I'm doing this partly to show you what's underneath here and partly because if you're like me and you drop a small screw down there now you won't be terrified as to what it's what's happening have just dropped a little washer that's okay I'll pick that up in a moment okay so I'll mention the ground strap there this is how the vacuum capsule connects there's a little spring here just get that out of the way and the points plate could come out As you see, the points plate needs to rotate, so that should also have a little bit of lubricant on it. Um, 
because otherwise it's not going to advance or retard properly either. What you could probably just barely see, but I'll rotate this towards you a little bit. These are the weights that control the mechanical advance. And there are two springs in there. Uh, you probably see a little bit better if I rotate it there. There are two springs in there. One of them is tightly in place. The other one is a bit loose. It is supposed to be loose. I can't tell you how often I hear of some, oh, the spring was a little loose, so found the problem, I tightened it. Well, it's not supposed to be tight. It's an advanced curve, not an advanced line. And these weights, which are down in there, I'll try and do this while I'm being able to show it to you. There's the weights. So the weights spin out as the RPMs increase. And they'll start spinning out a little bit quicker because there's only one spring acting on them. And when you get to a certain RPM, they'll slow down because the secondary spring starts to pick up and it increases some more tension on it. So uh, that's what slows it down. And then you get a, a faster slope of advance, which kind of tapers off. So it's still advancing, but not as quickly. And then you get to a maximum advance because it's going to hit on this pawl arm here. Uh, quick side note, if you want some additional advance, you can grind a little bit off that arm, and then it can rotate a little bit farther. Uh, don't do that unless you know what you're doing. I am certainly not one of the people that knows what they're doing, so please don't ask me how much you can grind off your pawl arm. I really don't know. Uh, but it's important to make sure that these weights are free, uh, that everything is moving freely inside of here. Uh, because if it's not, then you are not going to get a mechanical advance or it's not going to be a very consistent one. Uh, more often what happens is you'll advance it and when you let off the throttle it doesn't stop advancing because uh, the weights will fly out but then they won't necessarily fly back in. Uh, if you don't have a distributor testing machine that's going to be very difficult to see but uh, if you take th this apart to the level that we've just done if you lubricate everything, make sure all the parts are moving, it, it should really move very freely. Um, as long as that happens, you're probably going to be in reasonable shape. Your car should run and drive. Can it always be better? Sure, but it, it's not going to be anything that's going to be, uh, oh no, we're stranded because the weights are frozen. So, And then just a little bit better here, you can see that this moves freely. Okay, And that's important too. So that is the inside of the distributor. Let's start to put this back together now. So first things first, you want to put the points plate back in. Make sure your spring goes back on. Sure your ground wire is attached and then put the two screws back in. And by the way, your distributor does not have to be a 22D like this one. It's probably going to be very, very similar uh, if it's a Lucas distributor or some of the, like a GT6 or a Spitfire that's older would run a, a Delco Remy distributor. They are largely the same. It's going to be a couple pieces that are slightly different here and there, but generally speaking, it's going to be a lot like this in terms of how it operates. So you can kind of use the same procedures. Next we want to put in our set of points. Now, I am going to use a different set than the one that I just took out. I'll show you how to set these up in a moment. Now 
Now for the condenser. Okay, so if you'll remember, I mentioned earlier that a condenser is basically just a way to store a charge. So we can sort of measure that. A uh, voltmeter has a number of, di well, this multimeter technically has a number of different functions. One of them, on the voltage, you can check and see if there's, there's a voltage. So that's, um, is, there, is there current passing through something and how much of it? How quickly would be amperage? How much of it would be voltage? Uh, it also has this ohm section here, and these are just different scales basically, but what you're looking for is uh, resistance. So for example, there should be no resistance between these, goes to zero, okay? Uh, infinite resistance goes to one. So with a condenser, you're looking for a way to, to show whether or not it's storing a charge. So there will be voltage and then it'll go away. Uh, interestingly, with a voltmeter, the ohms uh, area uses the battery inside the voltmeter and it moves it from uh, the positive to the negative leads on these. So it actually pushes a current through it uh, and that's how it's able to read it. So we're going to use that to our advantage. And we are going to see on, on this case. So first of all there is we're going to see if there is voltage in it and there will be. It's going to be a very small amount and it's going to go to zero. So, eventually it'll go to zero. Okay. So, this capacitor has been discharged. Now we're going to use the ohms function and we're going to put a voltage into it. You saw it kind of flash at a number and then went to one. So in theory, this should have a charge to it. We're going to flip back to volts, just let this zero itself. And what we saw is that there was a voltage and it is slowly going back to zero. Show you again. Okay, so we've charged it. Let the voltmeter kind of settle down. Okay. And there you have it. So what we're basically doing is we have confirmed that this capacitor takes a charge and lets it back out, which is exactly what it's supposed to do. Typically, if it does that, this is going to be in good order. Uh, if you have a, a, a multimeter that will measure your microfarads, uh, I think in a TR6 this is supposed to be about 20 of those, but I, I can't do that with this voltmeter. I don't really need to. Generally, if you don't have a multimeter, throw this thing out because it's probably worthless anyway. Again, as I mentioned, it's kind of hard to get a good one. So there's your condenser. Okay, back over here, we're going to plug this in. Somewhere around here I had the screw for it. There it is. Answer is plugged in. Now it's important, by the way, uh, that you want to have your lead from the coil and the condenser and the points all on the same thing, but they're not going to want to touch this post. That's just to hold them down. You want it to touch the, the lead to the points, not this post. And that's why this little guy is made of plastic or rubber or a number of non-conducting materials so just be aware of that that also could cause a problem I'll show you how to test that but you want the little insulator in there
There we go. Trying to do this without keeping my hands in the way. A little bit less ergonomic, but that's okay. Quick side note before we go to put this back in the car. Remember I've got my multimeter set up so that you hear a beep when there's a closed circuit. Okay, so anything that's connected, like this wire which is all connected to itself, you'll hear a beep. With the points open, well let's start with them closed actually. With the points closed, this connection which comes from the coil will have a path to ground. Ground is the distributor body which is bolted to the engine, so that's metal to metal. The engine has a ground strap, goes back to the battery. So uh, the distributor body itself is connected to the negative terminal on the battery. So with the points closed, you'll hear a beep. With the points open, we should not. If you hear a beep with the points open, or if you're using your, your ohm meter and you see any number other than one, which there we go. So with the points open, there is no complete circuit. That's exactly what we want. It means that there's no uh, little pieces of metal in there that are touching. You didn't end up with a, I don't know, metal shaving that's going to mess things up that you're really just not going to be able to figure out what the heck is going on. So check that first before you put it in the car because you could do all this stuff in the car but it's much easier with the distributor out. Now we get to set the points. For this you will need a set of feeler gauges and a screwdriver. You want to make sure that this screw is just slightly loose because you want to be able to move the points back and forth. just a screwdriver in here and you can see you can move the points plate back and forth. So what we're trying to do is in a TR6 anyway it's 15 thousandths but in most British cars it's going to be the same uh, at least if it's using a Lucas distributor. These are all going to be labeled. Here we go 0 0.015 that's 15 thousandths of an inch and you want this to go between the points with just a little bit of drag. See, that's a little bit too narrow because it's not really going in. So we'll open up that gap just a little bit. Try it again. There. Right here, it kind of goes in easily comes out with just a little bit of drag. That's exactly what we want. So we're going to tighten it down right there. And then we are going to double check what we just did because sometimes it moves when you tighten it. Yeah, I think it's moving so I'm going to have to redo that. I think that's perfect. Don't forget to put your rotor back on. And your distributor cap. This is ready to go back in the car. I do want to show you just briefly if you've just built your engine or if you have the distributor out and you're not really sure 
Take a look down there with a the flashlight. You can kind of see that is the drive gear for the distributor. And you see the angle that it's at. And so with the engine at top dead center, uh, ready to fire on, on piston number one, uh, which is the very front one, this is what that drive dog should look like. It should be at about that angle. If it is not, then your rotor is going to be pointing somewhere that it shouldn't. It might not be in the right position to fire. Uh, in fact, the coil might be firing at the time that the, uh, the, the rotor is pointed between cylinders. So you really need this to be in that spot. Um, you could also have it 180 degrees out. So you see how it's kind of biased right now. The, the line is closer to the top than it is to the bottom. Well, that's how you know it's pointed at cylinder number one instead of number six. Uh, so if this isn't in that spot, then what you need to do is take out these bolts. Uh, you need to pull that housing off and you need to get that gear out. Uh, turn it to a little bit different of an orientation and then put it back in. Make sure that you're top dead center when you do that. And I found that the easiest tool to use is just a set of these. Uh, they are for uh, removing circlips and basically uh, you just hold it into the slot on the gear, extend it out, and then you can use this to sort of twist and pull and it'll keep a, a good grip on it. So. Uh, just a little bit of a trick because that gear is a little bit of a pain to get out. Uh, get yourself a set of these and get yourself a set of these and you'll be good to go. It's going to make it a lot easier. Now you're ready to drop the distributor back in. But it simply fits straight down. And then to get it to lock into place, rotate that shaft. So now this is going to be pointing at cylinder one. How do I know that? Well, I know that because there's a pointer at the front of the engine and some timing marks. And what you want to do is line that up if you're adjusting that gear. I've actually got it adjusted a little bit before top dead center. But you want to you want to set it where the, the zero mark lines up with the pointer on the engine. As you can see, I've got it set up a few degrees before, specifically 11 degrees before, because that's what I found in a shop manual for my TR6 for something called static timing. Anytime you have the distributor out, you're going to need to do this. Or if you don't know where it's supposed to have been set up in the first place, again, it's a necessary procedure. So let me show you how it works. First of all, make sure your ignition is plugged in. Before we get started with this, it's important to make sure that you've got the right coil in your car. Uh, there's a lot of cars, uh, especially the later ones, right around 72, I think, 73, Triumph changed to a ballasted ignition. If you've ever read anything about the 12 volts and 6 volt coils, this is important uh, because right around the early 70s is when you started to notice a lot of these changing. And so what happens is a 6 volt system uses either a resistive wire or it might be an external uh, resistor somewhere. A lot of Chryslers did that. And it takes the voltage at the coil down to 6 volts. So the coil's job is then to turn 6 volts into 25,000 or, or whatever number it's shooting for, as opposed to 12 volts into that. So it has to have a different resistance. Um, if you have the wrong coil, if you have a, a 6 volt coil that's supposed to turn it into 25,000, that's a lot of multiplying that it's doing with that 6 volts. Uh, but it's only given 6 volts. So if you try to do that with a 12 volt coil, that 12 volt coil is only going to produce half of the voltage at the spark plugs. You're going to get a weaker spark. So you shouldn't have the wrong coil in the car. You're going to need to know which one it is. If you have a 6 volt coil in a 12 volt car, well, that sounds good. You're going to get double the voltage, but you're also going to burn out your points. Uh, you're going to cause some other problems. So it really is important to know which one you have. And the way that you do that, start by making sure that the points are closed, which again, you can do with a volts ohm meter. Right? Remember, there's your sound. If the points are closed, you should be able to look at either side of them and there shouldn't be a current going through. There is on this side, not on this side. 
those points are open at the moment. So we've got to move our car a little bit. Or actually, let's just rotate the distributor. Now this should be closed. There we go. Okay, now that the points are closed, actually, let's leave this here. Instead of resistance, we're going to want to measure volts. So select it to a range that's useful. Uh, this is 0 to 20 volts. We're looking for It's a 12-volt system, so that's what you're going to see in a car. Um, and what you want to do is turn the ignition to the on position. And you want to see how much voltage you're getting across your coil. If I could find a spot to do that. No voltage, that's an issue. After plugging in all of the wires on your coil, then turn the ignition on. Remember, the points have to be closed for this to work. And see how much voltage you're getting at that coil. And wait to get a consistent number, actually. About 8 volts. Had this been battery voltage, which, by the way, is a little over 12, you would have a 12-volt system. Because it's an about 7 to 8 volts, this is a ballasted system. You must have a 6-volt coil in this car. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to work properly. Now you're ready to static time it. What you're going to need for that is a test light. Technically, you could also do this with a voltmeter, but test light's just easy to see. You've got one end of this, which has a clip on it. Put that on the positive side of the battery, because we're looking to see where there's a ground. So uh, anything that's, if you've got the positive end of the, one end of the test light, you can touch it to literally anything that's a ground, and you'll get the bulb will light up, okay? So remove the bits from the distributor. You don't need that lead wire. And if you recall, the rotor will be facing this way. The cap, when you get that back on, well, this fires at cylinder number one. That's where that's supposed to go. So we're pointed at cylinder number one. It's not firing yet. And what we want to see, see right now the points are closed, so that's a complete circuit there. When do the points open? Because when the points open, that's when the plug fires. Right there. See right before, there's a complete circuit right here when the points go out that's set to fire it's 11 degrees before top dead center you don't need the ignition on for this part and all I'm doing is just rotating the distributor until that happens and you want to go against the direction of travel so the rotor if you look you can even see there's a little arrow pointing in that direction the rotor is going to be spinning counterclockwise, so you want to turn the distributor clockwise, and that's how you get it to where it needs to be. Tighten it down, that's in the right spot. So I hope that's demystified some of the internals of the distributor for you. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to show you how to do an actual tune-up. I've already done one of these, but I'm not really happy with everything that, that went into it, so uh, this is going to be a little bit more specific and kind of show you the process. Now that we know the distributor's in good shape, now that we know the carburetors are in good shape, check out the other video I've made on those on how to rebuild Zenith Stromberg carburetors, by the way. But once you've done those things, you have good fuel pressure, you know the distributor is timed correctly, uh, now it's time to do the tune-up. And you do start by checking the timing, but it should be pretty close. So once you've rebuilt the distributor, you'll have eliminated a lot of those problems anyway. So I'll catch you in the next video. I hope this was helpful. And post in the comments below if you've got any questions. And please subscribe to the channel. It really does help a lot, and I appreciate it. Thanks.